Yeah, need it, sir. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, coaches. Good morning, fellow. Today is on the August 21st in the year 2021. And this is our business weekend, which is weekend two of the fellows program in the, in the fellowship national certificate uh, for mediators in Kenya, our virtual personal development uh, coaching course, which is running from July to November. This being our business weekend uh, part one, today's session is focused on mental health with uh, uh, fellowship coach, Coach Maina Azimio. And uh, the second part of it is focused on conflict transformation coaching and also practice development coaching. And this is our session or our segment with um, Coach uh, Gishinga Dirango, who is an arbitration trainer and will be taking us through arbitration 101. We wish to point out that the session on arbitration 101 uh, will have an advanced session, which will be a mentorship skill session, and uh, fellows may opt in for the second session if you wish to have more advanced skills uh, in arbitration and how the practice actually uh, takes place. Please look out for more information in your fellowship account. So I welcome you once again, and I welcome you once again, and we will start off with the words of our national anthem, and then be able to move on to the, pre the session or the segment with our coach, uh, Maina Azimio. Tutasema wimbo wa taifa kwa lugha ya Kiswahili, and I will lead. E mungu nguvu yetu, ilete baraka kwetu, haki iwe ngao na mlinzi, na tukae na undugu, amani na uhuru, raha tupate na ustawi. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, fellows on this fellowship program, I welcome you and please uh, feel at home. Coach Maina Azimio, we may kindly go on straight into your presentation. We will have Coach Maina Azimio's uh, segment, um, a health break for five minutes, and then followed by uh, fellowship coach Maina Durango, Gishinga Durango, and then fellows you, you're requested to stay on so that we can be able to have a further a bit of a discussion for 15 minutes on the uh, fellowship matriculation uh, weekend which was posted uh, and, uh, on, on the 14th day of August uh, just a review of just the exciting day that we were able to have with the presentations by the fellows and then also looking at what is ahead of uh, ahead of us and, also, and especially with regard to being prepared for the November lead-in summit, which is the more or less the penultimate for most of the fellows, but not necessarily conclusive for all of us. Uh, Coach, uh, my, Coach Maina, yes, we see your screen. You may kindly make it um, uh, a full screen. You may make it, kindly make it full screen. Uh, one minute, one minute. Yes, thank you. Make this full screen. Yes, full screen. <laughs> And fellows, uh, it's at uh, this juncture that we do also hope that you're having great reflections on uh, your experience with the uh, the with with the uh, matriculation weekend, which uh, was hosted uh, on seventh of uh, on seventh of uh, oh sorry on fourteenth of December, and also it was also the day that we took the opportunity to be able to reflect and also to remember our first fellowship director and uh, have a tribute for him, that is uh, Professor Reverend Professor Peter Gishure. On that day we, of the matriculation weekend, we had the co-director uh, who was uh, running the matriculation weekend. That is Dr. Sharon Sutherland of uh, Mediate BC in Canada. And uh, we also had a uh, guest fellowship assessor on Rebel Moses Wanjala who joined us uh, for uh, his input and insights and uh, our assessment of the, uh, the fellows. And we also had uh, 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 Reverend Dr. Peter Mbaro who is our fellowship uh, guide as we do proceed on and especially on the scholastic and the, uh, the academic uh, uh, support which we'll be able to discuss further in addition to other avenues that we'll be using for our presentation 
our publishing and also to promote the message that only you has got. So Coach Maina Zimio, yes. you may proceed. Uh, okay, <laughs> Karibu sana. Coach Thank Maina, you very much. You, uh, the time you have, yes, you have the time until, uh, uh, ten min uh, until five minutes to 11 so that we can be able to have uh, the break. Asante, Karibu. Thank you for being here with us. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I salute you all and welcome you to today's session. Uh, we were with you last month and we discussed in depth uh, physical health wellness. Today we want to move to the next level, but I wanted to understand if people got the gist of what we discussed the other time. And I'm hoping that at least now I'm not new, the introduction. Do we need more introduction? Angari, I want you to give me some guidance on that. Are these the same people that um, we had um, last time or the new ones? Um, uh, it, 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 is, it, is, uh, the, it is a team. The fellowship team is a continuing team. But uh, I would request uh, that you may just be, may introduce yourself so that each of the sessions we just have uh, the full information on yourself. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, just a quick introduction of who I am, Nuya Speaker. Uh, my name is Coach Maina Azimio. I am a trained and certified professional coach. I am uh, accredited to International Coaching Federation. I am also a trained and certified professional mediator. I focus on uh, commercial disputes, more so business uh, rivalry, uh, family wealth, and uh, things to do with the wealth is where I focus much on. I also, I'm also an entrepreneurship trainer. This one on entrepreneurship training, I am a experiential trainer. I share my own experiences in entrepreneurship. I've been in business for the last 35 years. So in the long run in business, I've accumulated a lot of uh, experiences. And I decided that I will not die with that knowledge to go and reach, and reach gra graves. I want to die empty. So over the time now I have retired from active business, I've become an angel investor to help other people who want to get into business to access funding. So I'm an angel investor. I'm also a venture capitalist. I'm a business consultant and I mentor people who are coming into business. I am a Pan-Africanist at heart. In fact, 2014, I formed a, a, a brand called FABA for Africa by Africans when I noted that uh, most African countries, we are importing almost everything that we use, not from other African economies, but from outside Africa, more so Asia, China, Pakistan, India, Korea, Brazil, then Europe and America. So then I am also a Tony Elumelu Foundation Entrepreneurship Mentor. Next week, we are starting to judge the applications which have come in for funding. There is a lot of money. I want to say this and that everybody should know this. We have more money than we have requests for funding. So if you want to get into this space, Karibu Sana. So this, I have mentioned about my businesses. I have formed my 19 businesses. Personally, I have formed many others with other people as a co-director. When I started, five businesses failed because I didn't have the experience. And that's why I decided to become an entrepreneurship trainer and a mentor. So I learned quite a lot from the failures and I went ahead to correct the mistakes as I was doing. Nowadays, I am good by experience. I'm very passionate about wealth creation through entrepreneurship. There are many ways to create wealth, but mine, I focus more on using entrepreneurship to create wealth because of the other added advantage that you get from being, a, being in business. I'm a trained man enough coach. Men have been having a problem. Ladies have been uh, promoted so much, which is good, by the way. We, our ladies, I salute you and I respect you. But men have somehow been feeling overwhelmed by the empowered lady. So what I did is that uh, to be able to bring up good men who can marry the empowered lady, I did Man Enough program and I'm a mentor in Man Enough to be able to bring men where they are. Then I am a financial intelligence coach. I advise medium, small, and uh, micro, small and medium enterprises, how to scale their businesses, especially now that you have gone to a borderless Africa. Most people who are doing business in Kenya, they don't know that the business they are doing in Nairobi can also thrive in Zambia. It can thrive in uh, Botswana. 
It can thrive in Ghana. So we help them to see the bigger picture in their businesses. And uh, also for me to be able to get more businesses to do mediation where there are disputes, I am called in to mediate. So I'm interested in uh, helping people to grow bigger businesses so that they are able to pay me well when I do mediation. I advise, I advise people on succession planning because I saw that most people are getting to a level where they die, their property also follows them to the grave. So that area we have not been doing good and it is time to make a change. And I want to be a leading expert in that area. So that's what I do. So basically these are the companies that I'm running. There are nine companies now and one foundation. Azima Foundation is our charity arm. So I have been, I have come to where I am through a lot of help by coaches and uh, mentors and trainers. So I did my, I did my and I, I did my coaching in a CDI, James Karudu Passion, Passion Biz coaching, uh, Sentonome Finance, uh, Peak Performance, James Gitao, uh, Dr. Awale Akinyemi, Dr. Nganga of Ascense 101, Robert Kiyosaki, I did his courses also, Robin Sharma. And uh, before I got to that level, University of Nairobi, so I was uh, an alumni there, and I was in Kakamega High School. My hobbies include hiking. I'm a navid mountaineer. I've scaled all the mountains in Africa, Kenya, Kilimanjaro, Luenzori, Meru, Elgon, Zote. Swiss Alps I have done also, American Rockies. And I'm a husband to one wife and two children. So I do hiking across the globe. I've, I'm hiking with Japanese here in Japan. I've gone to South America to hike, Peru, South America. I've done hiking. So yes, that's who I am. And uh, today I've come in on a different level, not the hiking. I normally tell people that never stop learning because I've never stopped learning personally because life always teach me what to do. Disclaimer, disclaimer before I begin, I am not a motivational speaker. Not that there's anything wrong with the motivation. We all need it, by the way. But I normally see that most people, when they listen to speakers, they listen for entertainment. They hear and they don't do anything about it. What I'll be telling you today, I'm sorry, I might step on your toes. Uh, forgive me for that. It is not deliberate, but I have to tell you the truth. So I do not speak to the heart. I speak to the mind. Motivation speakers and inspiration speakers, they address more the emotional part of the human person, which is okay, nothing wrong with that. But personally, I like getting into the thinking brain and we'll be going more into that because today we are doing mental wellness. I'm not a comedian. Comedian normally address the excitement parts. I am not an entertainment either, but I will use humor here and there to be able to inspire my audience to dream big and also manifest their big dreams. So I am a holistic wellness champion. So welcome to today's presentation. Last, last week, no, last uh, month, I discussed physiological part of the human being, the physical part, because we are in three parts, the physiological, psychological and sociological. So today we'll be doing the physiological. It has to do more with the brain. So what is this physiological part of the human? Mind, body, and spirit. Mind, soul, and spirit. So what is the difference? The physiological parts of the, of the person is the body, the soul, and the spirit. Question is, what leaves the body when you die? I want you to go to the chat box and give me an answer because we are born, we live, then we die. Last time we had my brother, uh, Professor Steven, but he is not with us today. So there's a separation that happens. And may the Lord rest his soul in peace. End at 12. But, but there is a, a separation that happened. The body and the spirit or the soul or whatever is separated. So can, we, can you tell me when somebody dies, what leaves the body because we bury the body? Is it the soul or the spirit? I want to hear from you today so that you can see if 
we are flowing together. So basically this, the gist of all the conversation that I'll be having with you as a wellness champion is how we can attain optimum health. Because wellness is, cannot be defined without optimum health. We defined wellness at the time. Like in religion, the goal is to get salvation. In wellness, the goal is optimum health. So what is health? I just can't restate that again because I said it last time. Health is a physiological, psychological, and sociological well-being of a person. It is not the absence of disease on infirmity only. It's bigger than that. So the psychological person has got several components. What relates with the human mind? Because the mind is actually the software that runs the whole body. It encompasses the biological influences, social pressures, and environmental factors that affect how people think, act, and feel. This time is a good time because there's a lot of our focus on our environment. Before, we were not very sensitive about the environment, but uh, those who are Catholics here, yeah, you know, Pope Francis did Laudato Si, which has got very good uh, insights on how we should relate with the environment. The government is doing a lot. The UN is doing a lot. World, nini, econo, nini, uh, World eco, Economic Program is doing a lot. So we all have to get our time into that space and I'll be connecting it to wellness and mental wellness. The sociological part of the human being, uh, it's uh, the social aspect. We are social beings unlike other animals. You see a chicken lays eggs, then hatch chicks, bring them up to a certain level, then fight them off. Wherever they go, they are not concerned. The same case with other animals, they don't keep family relationship. So then they come together only when there's a need. Even their multiplication, the way they multiply themselves, uh, this only copulation only happened during the time they are on heat. Not so for the human being, we are different. So we need to learn these things and know where the difference is. The interactions that we have as human beings have a lot to do with our mental wellness. Absence of human beings around you will bring isolation. It affects your mind. And it is always important that whatever you do, I'm not saying that you must marry. You can decide to stay alone. Uh, you, cannot, you can decide not to get married. You can even decide not to get a child, but you need human beings around you. Whoever it is, you need that connection, that relationship. It has a lot to do with your mental wellness. So what is the difference between the mind, the brain, and the gut? We normally say my gut feeling tells me. Eh? So you know the gut has a lot to do with uh, our thinking as well. And whatever is up in the brain also affects the gut. So today I want us to have a bit of reflection. Reflection. Just try to understand how do these things connect and why. The three of them, the four of them, by the way, they work very closely. So I would want you to see now, what is the connection between them? Let's start with the human mind. Remember there's a brain, the brain and the mind are not the same. Go to the chat box and give me the difference between the three so that we can be able to flow together. In a nutshell, the brain is a faculty by which one is aware of the surroundings and by which one is able to experience emotions, to remember, to reason, and to make decisions. By the way, this is the most important part of a human being. And uh, because a good book tells us that God created man in his own image and likeness, and we are God's co-creators, it is the mind that separates us from other animals. The other animals don't think the way we do. They don't develop their brain the way we do. And that's why despite being the weaker physically from the other animals, despite not being as quick as other animals, you know, an elephant, a giraffe, a zebra, they are very strong. We have got lions and leopards and cheetahs, which are very fast. A human being is able to control all of them. Why? Because our mind, 
So that's why I want us today to have a lot of uh, respect for the mind and see what we can do so that we can be able to maintain mental wellness. Mental wellness. Last week, we started with the physiological, the physical body, because the mind is inside the body. So if you don't take care of the physical structure, you will affect the brain because it is not outside. It is inside the body. So last week, we were, last month, sorry, we were talking about how to take care of the body so that you can secure the brain. So here, here we go. The human brain is the command center for the human central nervous system. It receives signals from the body's sensory organs. We did the organs last time and output information to the other parts of the body. And you can see for this diagram, the different uh, components of the brain. The brain is not one item, it has different parts. And it is important that uh, we get to understand which part plays what role. But because today is uh, just an introduction, I cannot be able to get into this in 50 minutes. So we normally teach this in depth and get people to understand different things you're supposed to do to address and to take care of different part of the brain because it is responsible for a different kind of an activity and interpretations. So it's very important that we know about this. And for you to get mental wellness, you need to understand what are the components of the brain, what role they play, and how you can take good care of them. The soul. This is the immaterial aspect of a, or a sense of a human being that which confers individuality and humanity. Even when you have your children or you have got twins or you have got your husband, spouse, whatever, your souls can never be the same. Your soul and your mom's soul are not the same. The individuality is in the soul. So that area, I don't want to go very much into it because it's the area of uh, spirituality. Uh, so uh, let me deal with uh, what I'm good at. So the gut and the brain, the connection between the gut and the brain. I don't know what you said. Uh, I don't have my, 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 my PA with me today. Wangari, I can ask you, or Emran, how, what have people said about this connection on the chat box? One minute. Any response? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. And uh, uh, Mediator Sarah, you can be able to uh, pick up any of the responses kindly. Okay, people said uh, concerning the first question, what leaves uh, the body when you die is uh, uh, some said the soul, some said the spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> the next one about the relationship between the brain and the gut. Uh, we haven't received responses for that yet. None so far. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. So uh, the spirit and the soul, which one leaves the body? Uh, is it, that one will, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we'll talk about it. <laughs> so the close relationship between the gut and the mind, it's so much such that if you don't take care of your metabolism, your gut, it will affect your brain. Last time, somebody asked about uh, detox. When last did you detox, by the way? How often do you detox? Do you choose the food that you eat? And this is a problem that we have, especially we in the middle class. We don't do these things. We ignore. Then when you're eating, you also don't understand the quality of the food that we eat. We eat for the taste glands. Utamu chakula, eh? If that is what you've been doing, Tafadadi, I'm just requesting you, just take more interest in learning about food and what effects they have on your health. If as a mediator, you'll only be useful to the people that you are helping to resolve blips and avoid them from growing into conflicts, transforming those disagreements, most more dis blips into opportunities to get to know each other better. Because sometimes friendships come from different angles. Sometimes you get into a problem. I know I have got some two friends. We became friends after I hit their cars on the road. 
So when we looked at what our damage have caused to the car and we agreed where we are going to repair the cars, in that process, by the way, we started becoming friends and nowadays we even visit each other. So it's not that uh, those blips and those disagreements are wrong. They are also good because if you manage them in the right way, they'll bring up some good relationship. So I'm trying to say that uh, if you are not taking care of your metabolism, it will affect your mind. Today is about mental wellness. Tafadali, let's look at it bigger. The communication system between your gut and the brain is called the gut-brain axis. Now we are going to the science. The gut-brain axis refers to the physical and chemical connections between your gut and your brain. That's why sometimes something might happen, it affects your brain, and you can diarrhea. You diarrhea. It is not something that is <laughs> originated from the stomach. It originated from the outside. The brain received it. It is sends signal and you diarrhea. Or you vomit. There are reactions. Why? Because of the connection. So whatever happened to the stomach, it will affect your brain. So your brain health cannot be proper without taking care of the metabolism as well. There are millions of nerves, of nerves and neurons that run between your gut and the brain. They are called neurotransmitters. And they transmit chemicals from the gut to the brain. Look at this. Your mood is made in the gut. Mood. So this connection is very close. It's like the soul and the spirit. You don't even know, you're not even sure what leaves the body when you die. There are constant bidirectional communication between the brain and the gut. The microbes in the gut communicate with the cognitive and emotional centers of the brain. 70% of the neurotransmitters like serotonin are made in the gut, then sent to the brain. So basically, that is a, an introduction to help us to understand what is this mind that we are taking care of. So what is the problem now? What is mental wellness, the subject of today? So the opposite of mental wellness is unwellness. And this actually is a big problem today. You can all agree with me that uh, hardly two days ago without hearing a case that makes you wonder, how did this happen? Yesterday, there was a case. In fact, uh, one guy sent me a very sad incident. There's a lady in Kitangela who took her life and even killed an innocent baby because of some uh, family relationship problems, which could have been resolved by a mediator. So mediators, please, uh, don't be chatting so much on the chat box, and you're not going out to get people who are in problems because we need to make impact by helping people to get over this. And I like what is happening because this process is going to make us better people. So how does mental unwellness begin and what should we do? Triggers, anxiety, anxiety. What is anxiety? When you're over anxious, it will lead to stress. If stress is not managed, it will morph into depression. So these are some of the things which are affecting our people in a very big way. So the question is, what is anxiety? It is an intense, ex excessive, and persistent worry and fear about everyday situations. There's so many things that are causing us worry and anxiety. In that case of uh, that lady who we lost yesterday and uh, she took away her daughter, it's very sad because uh, those fears and worries and problems, and many other people are doing the same, are the ones which are leading to that excess reactions. It is a feeling of fear or apprehension about what might happen, what might come. So if you're in control and you are courageous and take over the situation or seek help from a mediator and you know, from a counselor, uh, from a psychologist, uh, and from many people nowadays, you are psychosocial analysts. There are several professionals who handle this, so you can get help. Fast heart rate, rapid breathing, sweating, and feeling tired are some of the signs that shows you that you are over anxious. Anxiety is not bad by itself, 
but over anxiety might actually bring a problem. We don't know how to handle it. Then we have stress. So what is stress? It is a natural feeling of not being able to cope with specific demands and events. So what are the triggers of stress? This one I want you to tell me now, because we all go through it. I'm sure from where I sit that uh, we have many stressors, especially after COVID came and uh, so many things were disrupted. We are going through certain challenges. So according to you, go to the chat box and tell me, and I want us to participate so that you can learn together. Passive listening does not lead to you becoming a better you. Participation, conversation, and uh, contributions will be better than when you passively listen. So what are you currently not able to cope with? Go to the chat box and tell me, because I want us to flow together, because this is about us. This is real. I have mine. I'll be sharing mine, but I want to hear yours. What are the issues that you are not able to cope with in your day-to-day -day life? Get to the chat box. I want to hear what it is. You are on. No answer is wrong, thank you. Uh, keep them coming, keep them coming, keep them coming. Wangari appointed somebody to read this for me and uh, so that you can be able to flow quickly. Oh, I don't want to. Lack of finances. Uh -huh, Loss of income. Uh -huh. Thank you. TV news, money matters. Uh -huh. We go, keep them coming. What are the things that are affecting your triggering news of stress? People falling sick and dying. Uh, too uh -huh. many news of people suffering, retirement, uh -huh. family issues. Uh -huh. Balancing work and personal issues. Mediators, mediators. You can see the kind of work we have. We have a lot of work mediators to do. Illness in the family, current economic times. Thank you. We, we can stop there. Thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, so at least thank you for reading them for us. So it confirms, you know, this is a reality. So what we're saying here is that uh, we are going through a very challenging time in our lives. And we need to look for ways to solve this because you can't be well and you cannot be useful as a mediator if you are going through uh, over anxiety, if you are going through stressful conditions, because you need to be sober to be able to listen mm -hmm. and empathize with the person that you are going to help and have a way, think through a, an approach, which is going to help you to be able to help the people going through blips to transform conflict into relationships that are going to be long lasting and helpful. Note, stress can become a chronic condition if you do not take steps, the right steps to manage or overcome it. You cannot avoid stress by the way. So the best thing that we do is we help people to manage stress, to navigate through stress because in Akuja too, it is triggered by many things, so it akupata. But are you prepared to take care of it? So these demands can come from, like you just have said, uh, all these things, uh, work, business, relationships, is, is a big problem nowadays. I don't know what's happening. Uh, and that's why I did money enough. Family relationships, I listen to them. We have a lot of them around us. Not that I'm any, I'm any better, like in Zippo. Uh, family conflicts, we are called most times as mediators. I do a lot of this, especially in wealth, because uh, after the matriarchs, patriarchs pass out, children are not able to agree even how to share what does not belong to them. There are many con conflicts that are coming in, sharing, environmental issues. By the way, do you know that you are supposed to have 30 minutes every day in nature, communing with nature, for you to be able to live, to have mental health? If you don't do it during the weekdays, on Saturday or Sunday, look for two hours, go to a forest situation. Nairobi, you cannot complain, but then Nairobi is a beautiful city. And that's why internationally we are very highly recognized. We are the green city under the sun. So if you want to get time with nature in Nairobi, you do not struggle much. Go to a boretum, 60 acres in a boretum. Go to city park, 
you can walk to city park and arboretum from the city center. That is another 90 acres. When you go to Karura Forest, just next there, Karura Forest is 2,000 hectares, acres. If you come the other side now, those people who are living in Langata side, you can come to Nini Gong Hills Forest. That is uh, 1,900 acres. Come across Karen, and uh, in Karen now we have got uh, Nini uh, Ololua Forest. We have got uh, Lataka Forest. We have got uh, Nini on the other side towards Kikuyu. We have got another forest there called uh, Nini Kibiku Forest. So Nairobi is surrounded by forests. You can also go to National Park. Though there are animals there, you have to be careful. So if you go to the National Park, towards the route to Rongai, there is also a very good forest there. And there are private parks. You can go to Giraffe Center. You can go to Langata Botanical Gardens and many others. So it's only that we are not either aware and we are not doing things the right way. Lastly, spirituality. Spirituality. So these are things that can affect your mental wellness if you don't do them the right way. So it's upon us, first as mediators, to be able to take care of ourselves, self-care, then we share it with other people. I have gone to two cases, and when I looked at the people and what was the blips, which was making them want to get on a mediator, I found it was more a case of wellness. And I had them separate and took them through a certain process. I do a lot of this, by the way, and eventually they were able to get to reason together and see things in a different way. So now, the last level is depression. Depression has become a very big issue. We know so many people who have slipped into depression. If it's treated, you get back better and you become back to yourself and you're able to navigate life. If it's not treated in the right way, ah, ikoshida. Depression is a mood disorder that causes a persistent feeling of sadness and loss of interest in the things that matter in your life. In the clinical level, it's called a major depressive disorder. It affects how you feel, think, behave, and can lead to a variety of emotional and physical problems. We'll be studying the emotional wellness later in this series because emotions is another heavy area, very heavy. We'll work on it, but I will get into that after we have done the money part because we need money by day to get this thing happening. Come on, one of the reasons that people are getting into mental into uh, depression is uh, men, finance. And that one came first. I noted it came first. Come on, Chapa. You still not, you will not get yourself in a better situation. So you have, you may have trouble yeah, doing yeah. normal day to day yeah. activities. And sometimes, you may feel as if life isn't worth living. And that's what is causing people to take their lives. And it's very sad. So it is upon us as mediators to do our part. Together with other professionals who are in this space, the psychologists, the psychosocial analysts, the counselors, and every other person, this is a job that we all need to get involved. And it is about discourse. Disclosure, anxiety, Stress and depression are treatable conditions. They can affect anyone. It is a disease that requires more than pharmaceutical medicine. Some people, people normally rush to hospital to get medicine, but that is not enough. We treat causes. Why I like mediation is because we address the causes. And the moment you have treated the causes, you can avoid that problem. This is something that is happening. Uh, how many can recall this guy who is uh, with me here on the street, on, on, the, on the screen? Anybody, can you go to the chat box and say and tell me what he was doing? How do you recall Eddie Kimani? Anyone? Anyone who was watching TV in uh, the mid 90s, uh -huh. read for me, read for me, please. Actor, uh, Eddie Kimani was working at NTV. He was an anchor. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I can see that you're together. So uh, he's one of the guys actually who fell through a depression and he came out, he speaks about it. 
He's my friend that we've, uh, we, we work with him in uh, many of these areas because what happens is that uh, it's good to step out and share your story and tell people who you went through and use your experience to help other people. So we have had many people and uh, we, in my area of work, we interact quite a lot. We learn from each other, we help each other. And he is one of the people that uh, we need. And here comes my other friend, Michael Yer. So who can tell me who is Michael Yer and who he was? He was my teacher in coaching, in CDI. He's a coach in CDI. So how do you remember him? What was his role? Read for me. Uh, news anchor, KTN. Uh -huh. Very good. Thank you very much. And also he's very good in, uh, in, uh, in uh, emceeing corporate events. He's one among the top paid corporate MCs, Jimmy Gates. So these are kind of the names of the people who have actually gone into this. And Juzi, during uh, Nini, just the added uh, Nini, uh, Olympics, this case came up very clearly of uh, Simone Biles. And I'm trying to prove that uh, anybody can get into this. So even us, what you need is love. Uh, anybody who has got this mental case, uh, they need a lot of relationship. Uh, understanding, uh, love, support. So it is us to be this, and I would want us to move together so that we are able to get this situation managed. I said, if you don't manage it, it can take you down. Good thing. If you submit yourself, and the problem we have here is the like alcoholism, because the person who has a problem does not even know that he has it. So if you notice that somebody is having mental unwellness, it could be at the level of depression, it could be at the level of, of stress, it could be in the level of anxiety. So whatever level that you get him to, before he has slipped now to the level of needing the services of psychiatrist. Because sometimes people think that uh, any time that you say that you have mental issues, you have to say that you have to stigma, stigma. How do you destigmatize mental issues. And this is one of the things that is making most people to stay away from seeking help. The American artist, artistic gymnastic, Biles, is the most decorated gymnast in her generation. Biles also ties Sharon Millan for the most Olympic, with Sharon Miller for the most Olympic medals. So you can see now what kind of a person she is. And she got into a depression and she quit at the height after practicing all those time, even the delay, then she got into it. So you and I can also get into it. When last, this is a question to you, and I want you to actually answer this. I want this to get to you. This is personal now. When last did you do a mental check or a mental audit? Or have you ever done it anyway? How do you manage your internal stressors? Because stressors are two levels. There are internal ones and there are external ones. You should deal with your internal stressors. And you are the only person who can do with that because some of them it's personal. But then there are externals and that's where mediators come in. Because if it's involve another party, uh, you need uh, to reach out, either you or through an I mean, intermediator. So and that's where mediation comes in. So when, how do you manage? your internal stressors. Tell me, when last did you have your last mental check? Be very honest, if you have never done it, just say it. Maybe you don't even know where you can get it. Just say it, ask. The way we go for medical checkup, annual medical checkup, I'm sure you professionals, you do that. You don't wait until you are sick, diagnosed with cancer <laughs> stage four, and you should have detected it at stage one. If you normally go to check your health, you know there are markers that are used to be able to notice that uh, something in your body is not going well and it is reversed. Many diseases, especially chronic diseases, lifestyle diseases, if detected early, they can be reversed. Not so when they are outgrown. Anyone who has uh, chatted on this? Any response? 
can I get a feel of uh, what the response is? When last did you do your mental check? Just read for me, please. I would want to hear. Never asking where it is done. Uh, somebody said yesterday. Ah, good. What on earth is good. it? <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, at least now we would, I, I want to encourage us, all of us. So it is, uh, mental check is not Wazimu. So sometimes people stigmatize it and people shy away from it. It's good to know how your mind is operating because it has to be checked for you to know how it works. In Azima Wellness Retreat Center, we have experts in mental and lifestyle programs run by experts with many years of experience. You can check in our Azima Wellness Retreat Center, we have a website, you can see the team that we have and what they do. So we begin with a lifestyle audit and needs assessment. Okay, okay. We begin with a lifestyle audit and a needs assessment. Then if you have got an issue that requires to be handled, we help you to get through over it. Uh, this is Azuma Wellness Retreat Center and uh, it is in a forested area. We've taken care of the environment. All the things that I have mentioned earlier on that will facilitate you to get into a proper situation are taken care of. So environment is very important. Uh, so we take care of that. So let's move. What is mental health as I finish? Mental health. It is more than just the absence of mental disorders or disabilities, like the way we, we defined health. Mental health is a state of well being of an individual. Mental health is not something that you have, it's something that you practice. Not that you have it, you stay with it, it is continuous practice. It's like physical health. Even if you are a footballer, then you stop playing, or even Eliud Kipchoge who conquered the world, if he stop exercising, he's going to lose his health. So mental health is the same. It is a continuous process. Mental wellness is a positive state of your mental health. So some of the things that you need to do quickly, uh, some self-care ideas to maintain sound mental health. You go to consult. Okay, checkup is important. Just get checkup and you know how you're performing. The way you do for medical checkup, you don't know where to go to hospital when you're sick. Get yourself checked and advised, but you should take care of you. It's not the, the professional will tell you, but what are the things that we can do to be able to take care of our mental health and we become better people? So relationship, I had mentioned this. Uh, we normally do the in-person evaluation, needs assessment to see how you are in the patterns, your emotions, and we do in-depth background checks to see what could be leading to you going down when we notice that you're not doing very well. So during our checkups, we do all this thing. We need to learn a new techniques of self-care and regulation that can improve the quality of our life, community. I had mentioned this, as alluded to this, chicken and other animals and against human beings, we need each other relationship building. Building a solid community to, of support, love and friendship around you will be an essential part of your wellness journey. Surround yourself with people who wish you wish to become healthier, happier, and uplifted by the conversation that you have with them. I uh, you know there are those people who are always negative. The thing they talk is negativity. Come on, Kenyans. Hey, my brothers and sisters, we need to change this. Kenyans are always looking at what is not right. If you listen to conversation with Ken among Kenyans is negativity. Our TV, our radio, our social media, negativity. Hello, we want to change this. Environmental health. Your environment can significantly impact on your mental state of mind. Those who are subjected to daily stressors and living conditions that are less than ideal can negatively impact your environmental health. 
and cause mental illness. When last did you take a, a quiet walk and communed with Mother Nature? Do you do this? It is very important for your mind, body, and soul. Doing what you can to remove those aspects of your life that are stressing you will help you to reduce the stress response in your brain. Let's take care of the brain. It's a command center. It can contribute to reducing your cognitive functions. This is critical. This is critical. And I would want us to take care of this part of us in a way that will get ourselves operating, not to need treatment, but to maintain mental wellness. Self-care. Do you, do, do you practice self-care? Do you? The gifts of the last few years include more time to many. People are learning the fine art of self-care as we sit inside our homes, for we have no choice but to take introspection and look at what is, most of, is of most importance. COVID, by the way, has made us to reflect on ourselves. When there was during lockdowns, nowadays, so people are at home, and because where are you going? I used to like when uh, the, COVID, uh, the lockdown was happening at, was it seven or eight? So the early, the better. But at least by 10 now, utakuwa wapi uko inji, na hakuna ba. Unasema anga ati, kama wanauma wana kujaga jubani kama in the morning. Rafa unasema ati walikuwa. Anyway, I, that is not what I came to talk about. Doing those things that nurture the body, mind and soul and spirit to improve your health is very important. Good mental health in the 21st century, it was around going back to the simpler things in life. Creating a community surrounding yourself with people who are seeking a better health, better life and better health, taking care of yourself in ways that promote the ongoing health and healing. Practicing mindfulness. What is mindfulness, by the way? I would want to get from you what you understand by mindfulness. And there are techniques. A good thing, you can just Google these words. You'll get so much information among them so that you can practice them. The only request I want to make as I finish is that uh, you make sure that you do things which are going to help you to start getting in that state where you take care of your mind and your body and your holistic health. And some of this is something like yoga, meditation, journaling, deep breathing. They all provide a return to the present while learning to focus on little aspects. Those small, small things in life of our daily life. Professionals, we forget about these things and they are not very good. So thank you very much. I hope uh, you have got something that is uh, that will start doing. And thank you. I want to get back to Wangari. That was my presentation today. Uh, thank you very much, Coach uh, Minor. Uh, we appreciate uh, just a few of the comments from the people uh, present today. Somebody said that they treat their mental uh, uh, health by being able to do some self-care and they feel great after that. They ask uh, for your guidance. Um, participants, uh, we have a five minute break after which uh, Coach uh, Gishinga will be able to take us through um, arbitration. Uh, perhaps we, just before we go on the break, Coach Maina, uh, could you yes. kindly explain to us what mindfulness is? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, mindfulness is a technique that helps you to connect with your brain connect with your mind that helps you to come live to the realities that are surrounding you. So we are human beings, not human doing. We are not even human thinking. We confuse that what you do, look at it this way. When people are introducing themselves, they always say, introduce themselves with what they do. Now that's not who you are. What you do is not who you are. A doctor has a personal life beyond being a doctor. 
An architect has a personal life. A lawyer, I know lawyers are many here. I, I salute you, lawyer Geshinga. I need a lawyer, by the way. I want to have a senior lawyer like you. So a lawyer is a human being first and foremost than the profession that you are. So the question is, do you have the techniques that makes you connect with the person you are? And that's where people are equal. Our professions should not separate us from the human touch. There are techniques that get us into that state where you're able now to get to vibrate at the same level with everyone else. And that's the time you appreciate humanity. The church or the mosque is a very good place where at least there are no classes. Though anyway, there should not be, let me say there should not be classes. I know in Christianity is not like, is, like Islam. No, in Islam, hata kunanga viti. In a mosque, munaka achini kwa flow. Hata wakubwa wakikuja wanakanga kwa flow. You see? Lakini kwa church kuna viti reserved for certain people. So I know there's those, lakini siyo sana. Let's be honest. Not as much as what happens outside. So mindfulness is your ability to withdraw, detach what you do and who you have been groomed to become, programmed to become, to get back to the reality of you and put yourself into a situation that you start vibrating at the human level with everyone else. If you are a professor or you are a sweeper, at the human level, we all get hungry at the same time. We take food, we go to sleep. We need sleeping the same hours. We need oxygen. We need to exercise. We need to excrete. We need to do all those things. All the things that I mentioned. Last time I mentioned about 14 things that makes us who we are. So mindfulness is a technique and you can now Google it and you get more of it. Or we can teach you in a more level when there's more time or you get to our classes. By the way, all these things I teach them as programs that help you to get in depth and we practice, we practice. In our Zima Wellness Retreat Center, we have programs, some take seven days. You come and we actually accommodate, uh, we take people to, who stay in. You can do a program for three days, seven days, 14 days or 21 days. It's called Lifestyle Adjustment and Behavior Change Program. So if you want to improve how you do things, we are available and we can help you. You can always, side chat me, you can ask questions and uh, we can have these discussions, but this is just an outline, an introduction. I want you to reflect and see what you need to change in your life and tell another person. When you hear something good, please don't keep it to yourself. Don't be a container, be a vessel. Some people get information and contain it in themselves. Be a vessel who pass it over to the other people. I hope I've answered you. Thank you very much, uh, Coach Miner. Uh, colleagues, uh, we will now proceed on a five minute break. It is now 11 o'clock. We will resume at uh, 11 09. Thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning again and uh, welcome back. Uh, we will shortly be commencing the session to be taken through by Coach Kishangi. Welcome, Coach Kishangi. Coach Maina, you may drop your screen kindly. Coach Kishinga and Durango, welcome kindly. Good morning. Uh, I just want to start sharing my screen first. Just give me a minute. No problem, thank you.
so good morning. I want to confirm first that uh, you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to speak uh, on this particular topic. I'm really excited and thank you very much, Coach Maina, for the very insightful uh, presentation, which was really very, very uh, uh, insightful and I have really enjoyed listening to it. And obviously it's very hard then coming after such an insightful presentation. Um, I know I'm talking to mediation and uh, dispute resolution uh, professionals. And uh, the purpose I believe is not so much necessarily to share new knowledge, but to expand the frontiers of the knowledge that we have, because there's always a very close uh, relationship between what we do as mediators and uh, what uh, arbitrators would also be doing because they are really operating in a similar space, which is uh, dispute resolution, only that uh, the emphasis might be uh, different in terms of uh, the focus. So as uh, I had uh, uh, as had been indicated earlier in the intro that uh, was shared about this particular session for today, uh, I am uh, an advocate uh, of the High Court and uh, I'm also uh, an, an arbitrator and uh, a mediator. And uh, I'm really uh, very pleased uh, that uh, there's this continuing interest and more people are moving into this space because I think uh, alternative dispute resolution is probably what will unlock the pathway to improving access to justice, but even more significantly, assisting parties who are in dispute to find better ways of resolving their issues. So in relation to uh, arbitration, I will uh, now be taking you through uh, the, the major elements of uh, what arbitration is all about, and uh, then uh, we shall proceed on that basis. I think the first thing to note is that uh, arbitration is an age-old uh, method that has been used for many years mainly in terms of settling civil disputes. It's important to note that arbitration would not uh, apply to certain matters. For example, uh, family matters, family disputes would not be subject to arbitration. Uh, criminal matters can also not be arbitrated because of the nature. So it tends to be very much around uh, issues that are of a civil nature, maybe an employment dispute, uh, a commercial dispute. So those tend to be issues around uh, areas around which arbitration would uh, be used. Then the, the most important thing is that uh, unlike the normal uh, uh, ways of resolving disputes through the courts, arbitration is a private and consensual process. I think why this is important is that uh, what this speaks to is that uh, it allows parties to agree on the forum within which they will present their grievance to an independent third party with a view to that party helping them resolve the dispute. The other issue, of course, is that uh, uh, parties by choosing an arbitrator are able to pick an arbitrator who uh, is knowledgeable or vast with the subject matter of the dispute. So that then ensures that uh, there will be a certain level of confidence in the way that particular matter is resolved. So that's always an advantage. But I think uh, one of the things that uh, parties must always be satisfied about is that the arbitrator at all times remains neutral or impartial so that there is a uh, a certain level of confidence around the uh, decision or the determination that the arbitrator comes to. Uh, it's important to note from the outset that uh, an arbitrator, by virtue of being required to be impartial or neutral, must not be conflicted. Indeed, uh, an arbitrator must always uh, confirm 
whether there is any matter, whether real or perceived, that could uh, make him be seen as conflicted. And uh, there could be many instances where one could be conflicted. For example, that uh, one of the parties is someone who is well known to you, maybe he was your teacher, for example, or he's a close relative, or you have worked in the past with him. Those could be issues that could be perceived as affecting your ability to be neutral. And uh, the arbitrator must therefore disclose those circumstances so that the parties themselves can then make a determination as to whether they would like to proceed with that arbitrator. But the basic requirement is that where there's a potential conflict of interest, it is in the best interest of the party that the arbitrator does not proceed with that particular matter. But at the end of the day, that determination can also rest with the parties themselves. Then the other issue is to note that the arbitrator is limited in terms of what he can discuss. I think as mediators, we are very much aware that sometimes uh, you're trying to maybe just uh, determine a matter like just how property will be shared. Let's say there's a conflict around succession. But uh, when you get into that issue, like I remember mediation I was in, and uh, when you get into that issue, you realize that in fact, there are so many other deeper subterranean issues that inform the source of conflict amongst the family members that go over and beyond the specific issue or the brief that you have, which is about, uh, for example, maybe sharing of uh, family wealth. But you realize that there will probably be many other underlying issues that are determining that particular conflict. And at some point, in fact, uh, you end up having, first of all, to address those issues so that you can bring those parties to a point in which they can actually then uh, have the comfort to start discussing uh, the issue at hand. So, uh, so in that case, uh, uh, the difference with the arbitration is that in fact, the arbitrator is limited only to those matters that have been brought to his attention for determination. And that if there's a need for him to address any other issues beyond the, the locus of those particular issues, then in fact, the parties themselves must give him the authority to go over and beyond those issues, what we usually call the jurisdiction of the tribunal or the jurisdiction of the arbitrator. So it is very important to therefore note that the arbitrator must not look at any other matters that are extraneous or outside the scope of what has been presented to him. And uh, because that actually can be a basis on which whatever decision he makes can be challenged later by being told that he went over and beyond what he was supposed to be looking at. Then uh, I think the question then would be, why would parties choose to go into arbitration? What would be the benefits of arbitration which would then make parties want to have their matters resolved through arbitration? I think the first issue is that uh, by its very nature, arbitration is private. And private uh, privacy is important because, especially in commercial matters, there are many issues, uh, maybe because of the brand uh, risk that would arise out of uh, matters, for example, of a company or an enterprise being made public, there could be certain risks to the brand or to the company or to the reputation of the company. So uh, by going through a private process, it then means that uh, whatever is discussed will only be known by the parties who are uh, subject to that particular matter or that particular arbitration. And therefore privacy is safeguarded because of the risks that uh, would arise where privacy is not safeguarded. Then the other issue of course, is that uh, by being private, it also means it's confidential. Confidential in the parties that the parties then are able to openly discuss or disclose all the issues, uh, however uh, confidential those issues are, in the full understanding that these issues will just remain within that particular forum. For example, they cannot be reported in the media uh, and therefore 
they cannot uh, get out of the arbitration uh, platform that uh, they have chosen. And then of course, arbitration tends to be very flexible. Flexible in the sense that the parties initially decide uh, how they want the matter resolved, uh, what evidence they are willing to accept, uh, the times that they want to meet. For example, when you go to court, courts have certain hours. Um, the court has a certain day in which your matter is listed. So uh, there's not much flexibility, but in arbitration, really, uh, uh, the parties are very much in control and can therefore determine how that matter will be resolved. So flexibility is a very important ingredient of uh, the arbitral process. It's always debatable whether arbitration is cheaper compared to having your matter resolved in court. And especially so because, uh, you know, uh, following the 2010 constitution, a number of changes happened in terms of making uh, justice accessible to the parties. Uh, for example, a lot of court fees have been reduced. And even now, in terms of further reforms that have taken place since last year, 2020, 2020 uh, you'd be aware that, for example, on matters of uh, where the dispute involves one million shillings or below, in fact, there are no court fees that are paid if the matter is filed in Milimani law courts, for example. So there are a number of reforms that have taken place in terms of making access to justice uh, affordable, uh, and in many, in some of these cases, free. So the question has always been, is arbitration cheaper? Well, because the parties have to pay for the arbitration, unlike in the court where you don't pay. But uh, it's always uh, felt that uh, uh, because still courts are taking long to determine matters, even though there are a lot of reforms that are taking place to expedite judicial processes, uh, arbitration tends to be a much faster way of resolving uh, a dispute. And because uh, of that, then it can translate into arbitration being cost-effective in the sense that if your dispute can be resolved, let's say in 60 days, for example, or 90 days, for example, as opposed to a matter running in court for three years, the opportunity cost of uh, that delay can be detrimental to your business or opportunities can be lost as a result of the delay. A lot of money will be held back um, as the dispute is making its motions through the court. But on the other hand, when it's in the case of arbitration, if a matter can be resolved within a shorter time, parties are able to uh, quickly uh, you know, calibrate their next moves. They're able to release whatever was held up uh, uh, as a result of the conflict and uh, life continues. So to that extent, it is therefore felt that by being a quicker process, then it's a cheaper process. And uh, I think that's uh, the way that is perceived. I think the other benefit of arbitration, of course, is that in terms of uh, resolution of the matter, I think parties want to have the confidence that uh, whoever is dealing with a matter is a person who is competent, understands the subject area, and therefore, in a sense, is likely to come to a correct decision on the matter which builds business confidence. So that obviously tends to be a very uh, strong selling point for arbitration. Uh, it is important to note that though arbitration is a private process in the sense that it is not part of the uh, mainstream court process, uh, nevertheless, the judgment that is issued and it's called an award in arbitration the award that is issued at the end of the process is actually equivalent to a judgment of the high court. And therefore, uh, all that uh, parties have to do is to register the award with the high court for enforcement. So uh, in that sense, uh, arbitration therefore has the advantage of being able to come to a final determination that can be enforced as a judgment of the high court. and that is a very strong selling point or benefit of arbitration. I think the other uh, thing to consider or to focus on when looking at the selling points of arbitration is that uh, when parties, for example, go to court, 
they really, really don't have much choice in terms of who will listen to the matter. And uh, because they don't have much choice of who will listen to the matter, uh, that could of course create its own challenges or it might make them not feel entirely happy or confident uh, in terms of proceeding before a particular magistrate or judge. Uh, the contrast is that in arbitration, in fact, the parties themselves are in control on who will determine the matter. That is where parties themselves agree because parties are given an opportunity to choose an arbitrator. And it is only in exceptional cases where, for example, one party decides not to participate in the choice of an arbitrator that maybe then uh, uh, an arbitrator in a sense will be imposed uh, based on the uh, reference that was given by the other party of their preferred arbitrator. So that is the only situation where probably an arbitrator will get into a matter without the consensus of both parties. But obviously that is as a result of the inaction of one of the parties in terms of uh, the agreement that uh, is between them in terms of both of them being required to agree. So uh, the fact that the parties are able to choose who will uh, deal with their matter then uh, becomes important because in making that choice, they will look at a number of considerations. For example, the integrity of uh, the arbitrator, the knowledge of that particular person, the experience of that particular person, and many other considerations that they may consider relevant. And therefore that becomes a very, very important consideration. Uh, as I said, uh, in litigation, really, you, have no, you don't have that uh, latitude to determine who will listen or who will uh, deal with your matter. I think we talked about privacy in terms of, uh, you know, the, uh, the fact that arbitration is a very private process. And uh, therefore, that obviously would be important, particularly where there are issues, for example, maybe about uh, trade secrets, which you need protected, uh, that becomes very important because arbitration will certainly secure that that uh, happens. Then uh, the other issue is in terms of speed or uh, an expedited process. Uh, the point to note is that uh, since uh, the process itself is a consensual process, meaning that the parties themselves have agreed and have tendered themselves to this process voluntarily, then uh, the, uh, the parties themselves can actually agree, for example, if they want a matter disposed of within the shortest time possible, then they can actually decide, for example, that we want this matter to run a whole week you know, without any break until for example, we finish giving evidence before the arbitrator or whatever other decision the parties might wish to make. So uh, that becomes important because it then means that the, matic, the that particular matter can be resolved within the shortest time possible based on the need that the parties see to expedite the process. So that becomes a very important uh, advantage. Then uh, I think we have already talked about cost. Um, it's important, of course, to bear in mind that the parties would be responsible in an arbitration to basically hire the venue for the meeting. If, you, if a party wants to be represented by uh, an advocate uh, in the proceedings, then of course they have to bear the cost of uh, paying for the advocate. And of course the arbitrator uh, has, uh, has uh, to be paid. So this, therefore, this is what is usually referred to as cost of the arbitration, which involves, which, uh, involves paying for the cost of the arbitrator and any other costs outside of the fees of the arbitrator, for example, meeting venues, travel costs, if the arbitrator maybe has to travel to a venue and all those kind of issues. So those will be borne by the parties and that is important to always bear in mind. I think in terms of uh, flexibility, why this, this is particularly important is that uh, flexibility is important because then it allows the parties to determine very many issues. For example, parties can decide that 
we want to have very uh, a very informal process. Uh, in court, for example, you'll find that there are certain things uh, that uh, will not be allowed unless under very exceptional circumstances. For example, uh, what is called hearsay evidence. You might find that in court, there are very clear rules whether you can use hearsay evidence to prove your case. And generally, the general rule is that, for example, hearsay evidence will not be admitted unless under certain exceptional circumstances. Uh, but in arbitration, for example, you can decide, no, where you, even hearsay evidence can be admitted. If parties agree that they want that to be admitted, they will. Uh, you can maybe have, you don't have an original copy of a document, but if the parties agree that even photocopy documents will, will, will be admissible, the arbitrator, the arbitration actually uh, admit those particular documents. So, so there are certain flexibilities that the parties have and why flexibility then becomes important is that uh, it does allow the parties then to present their case to the fullest extent possible without being held back by rules or procedures and uh, they therefore feel the confidence uh, that they have had every opportunity to advance their case. So that becomes uh, a very, very, in terms of uh, representation, a party can choose by an advocate. Alternatively, a party can decide to appear in person. Uh, so, or even can decide to send a tech, uh, you know, a technical person. It's really up to the party how he or she wants to present uh, the, his case before the court. I mean, before the, the panel, the tribunal, but, in the in the in uh, matters that appear before the court, the situation is always completely different, because you either have to be represented by a lawyer who is entitled to practice before the court. If not, you have to appear in person. So th there are caveats or there are restrictions as to representation, unlike in the case of uh, arbitration. And then uh, the other issue to understand is that uh, arbitration has the advantage of having a situation where once a determination is made, once an award is issued, it's to a very large extent final. Final in the sense that there's very limited opportunity to actually challenge an award. And a party that actually wants to challenge an arbitration award usually faces a lot of uh, challenges in the sense that there are many things that you must prove for you to be able to challenge an award. The general rule is that courts will not interfere with arbitration because the parties from the very outset chose that in case of any dispute arising out of the contract on the agreement that they entered into, that their choice of dispute resolution will be through arbitration. And for that reason, the general rule is that courts will not interfere with arbitration unless they are very, uh, you know, uh, 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 overarching circumstances that actually uh, require them to interfere. And for example, that could be like maybe the rules of natural justice were not followed. For example, the arbitration proceeded without giving another party the chance to, uh, to, to present their case. And it's important actually to note this eh, because this tends to be a problem. There are parties who feel that if they do not participate in the arbitration, then the arbitration will collapse and uh, the, uh, the, the, the matter will not proceed. In other words, uh, once a matter is referred to arbitration, there are certain parties who completely do not respond, will not file any pleadings, out of the mistaken belief that if I do not participate, then the matter will not proceed. That is a, a very dangerous uh, issue because as long as a party has been notified of a dispute, has been served with papers through the address that is known to the uh, tribunal, 
as long as the arbitrator is satisfied that there is adequate notice served on the party, then uh, the arbitration will proceed, even if it will proceed on the basis of the evidence submitted by only one party. The arbitrator is entitled to proceed with that uh, matter to determine the matter on the basis of the evidence that is before him or her and uh, issue an award. So that is something that uh, parties must be very careful about and parties are usually mistaken. And at the end of the day, uh, an, an award might be issued against them, even though they probably had a good case had they chosen to participate. So now let me come towards the tail end of my presentation by just looking at what are the different types of arbitration that can take place? Because it will depend on the context and the matter at hand to determine how the arbitration will be conducted. So there are certain matters you'll find where uh, it's basically a, a fairly uh, straightforward dispute. Where, for example, there are, there are documents that are there. Someone is, for example, claiming a certain payment. There are documents in terms of maybe invoices that, uh, that were prepared, uh, were served and were not paid. Uh, there is a confirmation of work done or supply materials that were supplied for that, for this X amount. And therefore, the, 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 the documents that are available in that matter are enough to actually, uh, to actually make help the arbitrator determine what actually is owed to who. So in that particular case, it is possible to actually uh, manage that arbitration through documents. For example, there's a matter that I've been handling, which is basically a transaction of sale where basically one party is saying, I paid this X amount, I supplied this and I've not been paid this and the outstanding amount is X or Z. So in that particular case, it is possible to actually just look at the documents and actually make a determination based on the contract that was entered between the parties, what is owed to A and what is outstanding from B. So that is what you call a documents only arbitration, in which case it is up to the parties to ensure that the arbitrator is uh, given all the relevant documents for him to be able to make a determination. But remember that the parties themselves must agree on the documents that are to be delivered to the arbitrator, which means there must be disclosure from both parties to, the, to each other of all the documents that they consider relevant. So that if there's a dispute on any one document, that issue then must be determined before the arbitrator looks at the documents that are filed before him. So that is what we call a documents only arbitration. Uh, it is uh, favored in the sense that it is a very fairly quick an inexpensive process because not much time will be spent in terms of looking at those documents. And then uh, there can be another uh, arbitration where basically uh, parties over and above uh, presenting documents to the arbitrator will probably also uh, make some written representations to the arbitration to, for example, explain certain circumstances surrounding a certain document and why probably a conflict has arisen in relation to that particular document. So basically uh, the parties are able to clarify issues that might not be very uh, obvious on the face of record in terms of just looking at whatever documents are before the arbitrator. Now, what this then means is that uh, the parties essentially are outlining any issues that might be considered to be in contention and are necessary to be clarified for the purpose of the arbitrator, then making an independent evaluation of those particular issues. So therefore, this is a document only in a sense that there are documents involved, but over and above that, there are written representations that are made by the parties. Again, this particular process is favored because uh, it's also a fairly uh, cost-effective process and it saves time and cost for the parties involved. And then the other form of arbitration is what we call statement of case. Initially, this tends to be uh, probably the most widely used uh, arbitration in the sense that uh, a lot of the uh, 
the parties are represented through their counsel, through the advocates, and advocates uh, have a certain way in which they judicially handle uh, representation of parties. Basically, an advocate will require, like, they'll prepare formal pleadings on setting out the case of the party uh, or the defense of uh, the parties to a pleading that has been tendered by uh, the, the claimant, uh, the one who has the complaint before the tribunal. And uh, basically, uh, the pleadings would, of course, justify why they feel a party is entitled to a certain uh, to a certain uh, uh, payment, for example, or to a certain right that has been denied. And uh, obviously the other party will also, of course, give a response in terms of why they think that is not the case. So this uh, initially therefore be, tend, tends to be the way in which most arbitrations, uh, I mean, a majority of the arbitrations are handled. And uh, obviously uh, parties therefore are able to present their evidence on the basis of those claims. Uh, the important thing is to note that uh, such uh, documents will uh, contain the facts of the case in terms of uh, the relations between the parties leading up to the dispute that is now before the arbitration. Uh, this could also inform also the legal arguments that could support that. So what are the legal grounds uh, to support those particular contentions? And what is the evidence that is there to actually uh, uh, beef up that particular contention? So, uh, so that becomes important. And uh, it's important to note that uh, it's a very common way in which parties sometimes would want to deal with their matters. And then of course, there are formal pleadings, uh, which basically are tailored very much around the way courts would deal with issues in terms of the peak evidence from all the parties, they listen to the parties and then make a determination on that. Now, uh, a lot of uh, matters nowadays, uh, when you look at uh, arbitration agreements that are entered between the parties, you'll find that uh, a lot of the parties would usually uh, have in the agreement that in the event of a dispute, the, the appointment of the arbitrator will be handled by a certain institution. So for example, you'll see in some of the contracts, the Law Society of Kenya uh, through its chair or the president for that matter is to appoint the arbitrator. In other uh, instances, you'll find that the arbitrator is to be appointed through the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators or through the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration. So, uh, so where an institution is a, the appointing authority, this is called a rules arbitration in the sense that the, uh, the institution itself would usually have its own rules on how arbitrations are to be conducted. And the arbitrator obviously must then ensure that there is full compliance with the procedures as set out by the particular institution. And uh, this would obviously be mean that if there is non-compliance with those procedures, that can actually be a ground of saying that there was a misconduct or even that particular process can be challenged by either party. So let me uh, wind up by looking at what is the role of the arbitrator in a dispute. I think, the most important role that the arbitrator plays in a dispute is to guide the parties. The arbitrator provides guidance in terms of how the matter will be handled, uh, guides the parties to understand what their obligations are, what their rights are, so that there's an orderly uh, way in which the particular dispute is handled. So that is the first uh, role of the arbitrator. And the arbitrator would usually do this through what we call the interlocutory phase, which is where the parties meet, they agree on the ground rules, they agree on how they'll share documents and pleadings. So that st particular stage uh, is, becomes very important in terms of ensuring that all the parties are comfortable with the way the matter will be handled. Then the other uh, important issue, of course, is that 
the parties must not come into an arbitration and end up being ambushed by either party where, for example, uh, documents are being uh, you know, relied upon that they have actually never seen or they are not aware. So uh, that therefore means that in terms of the way the parties exchange documents, the arbitrator must ensure that it is in such an orderly manner that the parties have sufficient notice of all the issues that are being conversed in the dispute and that all the parties are fully aware and they have sufficient time to respond to those issues. That avoids trial by ambush, so to speak. Then of course, the arbitrator has an important role in terms of presiding over all the meetings, particularly uh, the meetings that will take place in what I call the interlocutory phase, which is the phase that happens before the actual hearing, where maybe parties present their witnesses and they give evidence just like would happen in a court. The arbitrator must ensure that he presides over those meetings, that he manages those meetings in a way that all the concerns that the parties might have are addressed, and therefore there's an orderly way in which the matter is handled. And of course, in terms of the hearing, the arbitrator again has an important role to ensure that the actual hearing proceeds in a way that each party is given an opportunity to present their evidence, whether this is through their witnesses or through uh, any experts they might want to call before the tribunal, that there must be sufficient opportunity and scope for the party to present their case. And then of course, finally, as I had actually alluded to much earlier, is that the arbitrator is only required to make a determination on the matters that the parties have presented before him to determine. Uh, we usually uh, require parties to list uh, formally the list of issues so that the arbitrator knows that party A would like the following five issues determined, party B would like the following three issues determined. The arbitrator then has an obligation to look at the 10 issues, for example, that both parties have presented before him, and then find whether there is any convergence between the part, the issues, so that uh, he can deal with those issues together. But at the end of the day, the award must deal with all the issues that the parties presented to the arbitrator for determination. A failure by the arbitrator to determine any of the issues can be a ground in which the arbitration can be challenged and the court, the high court, can order the arbitrator to make a determination on any issue that was uh, presented before him and which was not uh, handled. So that becomes a, a very important role for the arbitrator. And uh, that would be the end of my presentation. Uh, I hope uh, it has provided you with some insights uh, basic insights in terms of what is involved in arbitration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Coach uh, Kishinka, for being able to take us uh, through that, just to be able to help us understand uh, arbitration, the process and the role of the arbitrator. Uh, perhaps uh, you could uh, guide us as mediators. Is there anything that, uh, uh, given that both of them are, you know, uh, alternative dispute resolution method. Is there anything that you think as, as mediators we could borrow from the arbitration process? Uh, yeah, as uh, I said from the beginning, you know, we are dispute resolution resolvers. And uh, I think uh, the thing I find with arbitration that uh, could certainly be very useful in informing the way we uh, handle mediations is that uh, we must always uphold those tenets of uh, being impartial and neutral. Uh, a lot of the times mediations can also suck us in uh, because they can also bring out a lot of emotional issues. And I think even in the last uh, session that we had, there was that recognition that sometimes even mediators might even need some counseling because they can be sucked into a lot of issues in the course of mediations, especially in family matters. I think the one thing that uh, mediators can borrow from uh, arbitration is that it is very important as much as possible to stick to those issues that are at the heart of the conflict. 
and where maybe there are other extraneous issues that you feel are also important to be resolved in order to bring the parties to a space where they can then be able to now deal with their issues uh, more comprehensively, it is important to maybe find an alternative forum within which those issues could be handled. Probably even, uh, you know, maybe referring the parties to some counseling or uh, some, you know, mechanism where they can ventilate on those issues so that now in relation to the issues that they have presented, for example, to the court and which have been referred to mediation, then those matters can then be uh, handled more comprehensively. So I think those are, that's one of the issues. Of course, uh, the whole issue is around integrity, ensuring that there's an integrity of the process, that the parties are made to feel comfortable uh, in terms of uh, presenting their matters before the, you know, before the mediator. All those are important uh, issues that uh, cut across both arbitration and mediation. Um, thank you very much. Uh, perhaps in just uh, closing, you could uh, give us some guidance. If there is a mediator who perhaps is interested in becoming an arbitrator, what is uh, what should they do? Or what is required? Okay, thank you. That's actually a very good question. Uh, and uh, because we are dispute uh, resolvers, I think uh, it's important to know that one can match different skills. Uh, basically, if one wants to become an arbitrator, I would uh, advise that uh, they contact the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. It's on Gong Road, Nicholson Road. Uh, and uh, they run different courses right from the very uh, start, which you call the associate level. And uh, that introduces you to what arbitration is all about. Uh, and then uh, after the associate level, there's the next stage, which is uh, the member level, which now moves more into the more advanced issues uh, around uh, the legal issues, uh, you know, understanding uh, various aspects uh, that would be important in uh, running an arbitration. And in fact, once somebody uh, becomes a member, once you, uh, you successfully do the modules for membership, you're actually entitled to practice now as uh, an arbitrator you'd usually be attached to a senior arbitrator to learn more in terms of how the actual arbitrations are carried out. Like for example, currently I'm having two mentors that are mentoring on uh, an arbitration. And then uh, over and above that, then you can still go higher and become a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, uh, which then is basically just scaling up your skills around, uh, you know, more advanced areas of arbitration. So that uh, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrator at the moment is the route uh, that one can take and uh, they are always very open in terms of uh, providing that training. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Coach Kishinga for being able to take us through that particular uh, session. Okay, I will just uh, hand over to Wangari. Thank you, mediator Sarah, for uh, walking us through uh, this particular segment or this particular session. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that uh, today has been a very valuable uh, business weekend as uh, we do call it at the fellowship. The business weekend is an opportunity for us to be able to uh, tap into uh, either new opportunities. Uh, the business weekend is an opportunity for us to tap into new ways that we can be able to either add on into our mediation work. And also uh, at the same time, it's also an opportunity for us to be able to uh, see what are new avenues or uh, new, uh, new, 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 new systems that are really out there that we could also be able to tap into as, uh, professional, as professional mediators. 
And uh, so at this particular juncture, uh, we thank our fellowship coaches for today. And uh, the, uh, the fellowship coaches have actually given us uh, some very good insights, which uh, sometimes we probably have uh, either not been very conscious about. Um, I will say on wellness, we have the aspect of wellness that we have been able to uh, learn on today. And uh, in uh, being able to uh, discover the, the area of wellness, we've been able to discover also that you can do um, an audit. Eh? And uh, in, uh, in doing an audit, then it's a great opportunity for us to be able to, let me say, much add, add on, because yes, uh, um, mediation happens to be just one of the areas that uh, as, as, as mediators, we can be able to uh, add on to what the skills that we do have as uh, professional mediators. Uh, Mediator Sarater, are you able to, uh, to screen share the, 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 the fellowship uh, uh, section so that we can be able to go through now uh, just a few things on the fellowship as, uh, as, as fellows. Uh, we would first like to be able to uh, close this uh, part of, uh, of, of the discussion and then um, advance on and carry on to the, to the next part of, of, of the fellowship. So um, uh, mediators, uh, Sarah Tell, kindly support us in that. Yes, uh, we have the fellowship. Uh, we have the fellowship information. So to allow us, so that we can be able to make uh, to release also the the the, the, the coaches if if, if, there, if, if there is um, a need to to be able to release them. Uh, at this juncture, we will have the words of the Kenyan national anthem. And then after the the Kenyan national anthem, then we will then proceed on and for the fellows, we request that you hold on, uh, that uh, we can be able to take in any, uh, uh, any, any, any inquiries following the matriculation, matriculation weekend. Uh, Coach Maina Gishinga, there's a query that I see uh, on the chat and possibly just before we, we move further, you can assist us with that. There's uh, Coach Gishinga, sorry, not Coach Maina, Coach uh, Gishinga Dirango, Coach Gishinga. Fellowship Coach Gishinga. You can hear me? Okay, uh, there's, there's an inquiry that, uh, okay, Coach Kishinga is back. There's an inquiry that we see on the chat that uh, is an inquiry with regard to, uh, does one have to be, uh, does one require to be a lawyer to be, to be um, an arbitrator? Uh, Coach Kishinga, are you able to speak now? Uh, Fellowship Coach Kishinga, are you able to speak? So the inquiry that is uh, on the chat as to whether one requires to be uh, uh, a lawyer or one requires to have uh, a certain uh, professional background to become an arbitrator. Uh, yes, I see a comment that says that you do not uh, necessarily have to be um, a lawyer or an advocate for you to be able to uh, become a, to become an uh, arbitrator. And uh, so we hope that uh, with the guidance that we have been provided by uh, uh, our fellowship coach today, that we will be able to now be able to make use of that and get, uh, be able to now access uh, channels that can be able to help us learn more. Because part of the intention is that we can have additional skills that we can be able to make um, to make uh, use of as uh, as professionals and be able to serve better as dispute resolution professionals. So at this juncture, I uh, uh, will uh, uh, close this uh, part of the of, of the of the of the fellowship, thanking our our coaches for um, spending time with us, and at the same time also acknowledging uh, acknowledging the fellows for uh, joining us um, at this particular time. And uh, Coach Maina Azimio, we say thank you for uh, your time with us. Coach Kishinga, we also acknowledge you and say thank you for. Uh, spending time with us. Uh, Coach Gishinga, are you able to speak? I see that you Yes, I am. Sorry, okay, I was wonderful. having a problem and meeting. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. And, yeah. yes, we I have, have a question. You had the question. Okay, yes, kindly support us, yes. kindly respond to it. Thank you. Yes, and, and indeed, uh, indeed, that response is correct. Uh, one doesn't need to be uh, a lawyer to be an arbitrator. 
And in fact, uh, what is emerging, remember, I did <clears> mention <throat> that uh, arbitrators tend to be chosen also for their knowledge in certain areas. So for example, uh, someone like, for example, who's in IT, could be a very good arbitrator, maybe if a conflict involves an IT related field. So there's also, a, there's a, a very big encouragement for people from all uh, diverse professions to actually be an arbitrator, because at the end of the day, the greatest skill of the arbitrator is the ability to listen to a matter, to address the issues in conflict, and to be able to make a determination on those issues. Uh, the point is that because there are a lot of legal issues that obviously would arise maybe in terms of evidence and those kind of issues. When you're doing the different modules, you'll actually find that there are specific modules. If you are not, for example, a lawyer, then you'd have to go through uh, those different modules like the law of tort, the law of contract, the law of evidence, all those issues you'd have to then go through and learn. Uh, if you're a lawyer, if you're a lawyer and you therefore did them in the course of your study, you'd be exempted from those particular modules. So uh, just to emphasize therefore that uh, arbitration is open to all fields of professions. Okay. Okay. Asantis, yeah, thank you very much for that guidance. And uh, as uh, colleagues, I, uh, the, part of the reason why we have the uh, discussions on arbitration and we actually have two sessions. We have this session, which is part of the, uh, of, of the five uh, workshop sessions that we have in the fellowship. And we also have another mentorship se uh, skills session that will be coming up with uh, Coach Kishinga, where specifically we'll be having tips uh, on, uh, on, on, on how to arbitrate or how a, a, an arbitrator does uh, their work today was really an overview. Is this so that you are a dispute resolution professional? Can we have an understanding of what um, happens in this particular work? So with that, uh, we'll invite that we can be able to say the words of the Kenyan National Anthem. I will lead us through that segment. Uh, uh, so I went to my video, video to my last time. So we, we apologize for that uh, uh, interruption. And uh, so uh, I will lead us in the words of the Kenyan National Anthem, and then we will be, have, be able to have a short uh, discussion as the fellows uh, with regard to the follow-up to the matriculation weekend, which was hosted on 14th uh, with the uh, uh, fellowship co-director, uh, Dr. Sharon, and uh, also with uh, the fellowship guide, uh, Reverend Dr. Peter Mbaro, and uh, also with uh, Honorable Moses Wanjala, who was uh, the guest assessor for our, our, our session. So, Wimbo wa Taifa, and we will have in English, O oh God of all creation, bless this our land and nation, justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace and liberty, plenty be found within our borders. So, um, Asante Nisana for joining this particular session. We take a one minute break. And the next part, we will now be looking at the next uh, segment of steps for the fellows uh, and also for the, pay, the, the, the official payers that we have as we advance on in uh, towards the November lead-in summit and especially with the focus on uh, mediators as speakers uh, to be able to present, publish, and also to promote um, our message. So let's have a one minute break and then uh, do be able to get back. It is five minutes past uh, two, noon. So at exactly uh, seven minutes, so that you have the minute break, seven minutes, at seven minutes past noon, let's uh, uh, get back on together for uh, another uh, seven minutes discussion. Thank you very much. I thank the coaches for joining us. Uh, coach, uh, coaches, you're welcome for this next segment. And uh, Karibu Sana. Thank you, for, uh, Fellowship Coach Maina. And also thank you, Gishinga Jirango, for your time. So let's have the one minute break and get back. Asante. Okay, I welcome you back, uh, uh, fellows and uh, colleagues, onto the onto the uh, onto the call. So today is our part of our fellowship national certificate for mediators in Kenya, and our session today has been uh, with uh, uh, a wellness uh, uh, fellowship coach, that is Coach Raina Azimio, and uh, also we've had um, arbitration 101 uh, with uh, fellowship coach Gishinga Dirango. And uh, today is a Saturday, August 21st, our session from uh, 10 a.m. I wish to thank our moderator, uh, mediator Sarah Ter, and uh, uh, I am Wangari Kabiru, the uh, convener and also the fellowship lead for this, uh, for this particular program. 
So at this juncture, we would like to be able to look at uh, the uh, fellowship director's assignments. And uh, this is an important area because it covers two parts. It covers the segment that as fellows, we get to be able to uh, um, appreciate the role of the, uh, the fellowship accountability circle team, which is the official uh, pairs. Uh, remember when you're part of this uh, fellowship, you can do uh, pairs with other peers, either who are uh, doing a, a similar uh, sessions as yourself or others who you like or you know, and uh, that, that is still acceptable and that is still allowed. But uh, we also, just for purposes of structure of the fellowship, we have the official pairs uh, within, uh, within the fellowship. And also at the same time as we go through the fellowship, because we are out, the outcome of this fellowship is that uh, we are leading to, towards the November lead in um, summit. And also uh, at the same time that we improve ourselves in our uh, not only knowledge uh, skills, but also in our capability to be able to step out as uh, mediators, as, as fellows. So let's look at um, um, uh, the two key areas that are uh, important for us to be able to appreciate and understand so that we can be able to uh, uh, advance on with our fellowship uh, much better. So we have the fellowship accountability circle team, which is the official pair. Now, let's remember we had the matriculation weekend and that was on uh, August 21st and we had a group of fellows who made their presentations. So the moderators have gone through the uh, the 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 the. the, the fellows who made their presentations and uh, the fellowship director has, or has actually uh, reset with regards to how the official pairings will be done. And that information will be shared out so that we can be able to uh, now know uh, once we presented at the matriculation event that uh, the, um, who, who, who we are now pairing with. And there are two assignments uh, that are the fellowship director assignments, which uh, we, we, we are to undertake. Uh, with, uh, as part of the official pairs. And this really is also coming from the context of it's an opportunity for us to be able to interact as fellows, uh, to be able to know who else is out there and also how can we be able to develop this work together. So we have the first uh, assignment, which is uh, related to court connected mediation. And, and it's a, an assignment that's due in September. And the next one is an assignment that's uh, on mediation advocacy, developing a mediation advocacy plan, and it's due in October. So you will find that for some of these uh, uh, segments of assignments, you will either find in, uh, especially uh, through the mentorship sessions, that you will be able to um, gain skills that you can be able to make use of. Uh, the other part uh, that's important for us to also uh, appreciate is uh, um, as, as a fellow, the self, what is um, uh, the, the, the required of us as we are running through this particular fellowship. And so we have the five fellowship weekends. So today is one of the fellowship weekend, the business weekend. And we have the five fellowship weekends. In addition, we have the mentorship skill sessions, which are designed for the mentorship skill, skill sessions are designed for if you find that there's a skill that is being discussed on and it's something that you either want to learn more about or to advance in, then those sessions are available for you to be able to join. So we have the we have the fellowship matriculation uh, fellowship topic matriculation weekend presentation, which is a two minute presentation, and that we did on October twenty first. We are aware that we have a group of fellows who did not make their presentations, and I will be speaking into that uh, also. Um, so the next part that's coming uh, following our two minute presentation is for uh, we as the fellows to de to design our fellowship topics in the form of a blog article. Or a blog article is a, is a much more simplified way for us to be able to uh, write out what, uh, what we, 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 we have as our fellowship topic, and this is in 500 words. So this is due in August. Remember when we were coming in for the matriculation weekend, we actually wrote down our, our, our particular message. So this is a chance for you now to just go back into it, and as we are still preparing for the main um, summit, where we'll be making a seven minute presentation, look at it and now write it out in a way that can be made into an article. A blog is normally a short, a shorter article. Uh, it yes, communicates the message. And this, remember we are preparing ourselves to present, to be able to publish and to also be able to promote our message. So the, the, by, by doing this with our fellowship at, uh, articles, presenting at the fellowship uh, weekend and also being able to prepare the blog article, we actually are achieving this. Now, leading into the November leading summit, uh, specifically for the fellow, when it comes to our own uh, fellowship topic. So let's remember that we are preparing for the seven minute presentation. 
an important tip is prepare for five minutes. I'm sure as we are listening, as we listen into the matriculation weekend, which will be shared in, we will be able to see how we made our presentations and also at the same time, what are possible areas that we can be able to work on. As we are preparing the matriculation weekend, we kept saying, prepare, it's a two minute presentation, prepare for one minute so that we can be able to um, accommodate or cover the, uh, the, the additional time with your introduction. And also there are very specific guidelines as to how to make your presentation. So prepare for five minutes as you do go on. You have an official pair group that you can be able to be tapping into to support you in that particular journey. Again, also, we will also be preparing um, that at the, our fellowship topics with an, now an, a, a much more elaborate article, which is 1,000 to 1,200 words. And this is due in, uh, in November. Uh, as you're familiar, we have our fellowship guide, and uh, that is um, uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Uh, uh, Peter Mbaro. We will be taking a journey with uh, uh, Dr. Mbaro to be able to support us, to be able to advance our work into a journal. A journal is a scholastic and there is need for scholastic support so that we can be able to, uh, to, be, to be ready and prepared or to have our publications uh, ready uh, for purposes of scholastic um, writing, which is actually a key aim that we do have. Now, for any of us fellows who probably have not done scholastic uh, writing, which is uh, normally very um, um, normally academic when you know, sometimes even going to the field research or even if you have done it, let's relax. And that is why we are taking this journey as a, you know, we are taking this as a very uh, uh, paced journey. Let's write out a, a blog article, a blog, a blog is 500 words. Remember when you were coming for matriculation weekend, you wrote, you wrote out and it was probably just a, you know, a one page and that could have been about like 200 words or 300 words. Now you move into the blog of your same topic. Key things that we need to remember and especially this uh, came, uh, was, was insights from the, uh, the, 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 the fellowship um, uh, assessor that is our Honorable Wanjala. Let us make our topics very, very specific. And that is also what will support us and enable us to be able to have a message that is very sharp and com uh, well communicated and also to give us a positioning that we can be able now to promote as part of our messaging as, 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 as fellows. So please tap into your, uh, your, uh, your official pair group, which is we are calling the FACT Fellowship Accountability Circle Team, the FACT, uh, your FACT uh, pairing, and be able to ask them, is my topic now sharp? What do I mean by this? For instance, if you say that your topic is workplace mediation. Now, please go back to your uh, fact uh, pairing and ask them. Uh, my, my topic is, um, my topic says uh, uh, that uh, I will be speaking about uh, workplace uh, mediation. So specifically in workplace mediation, then I will be speaking to the aspect of um, how uh, human resource uh, managers or directors can ensure that the work uh, contracts are dispute, uh, their dispute, uh, dispute is approved using mediation clauses. That's a very specific topic that now I can be able to write about. What that means is that then we will support each other and make sure that we are not roaming all over the place. Please feel free to also post your now very specific topic in the uh, fellows chat group so that other fellows can be able to support you and can be able to now guide you and uh, be able to advise with regards to, yes, is, are they seeing that your topic is actually now a sharp topic? Remember, we have said the business we are in uh, through this fellowship is a new, uh, good and clear idea. And it is one which will now be saying belongs to you. You know, it does not belong to everybody else. It is one that belongs to you. It is one that you, you, you own and it's a message that you can be able to advance in. Why is this particularly important? As we speak now, uh, we have uh, received an invitation that uh, 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 for um, several conferences that are coming up later in the year. And each of these conferences is seeking to have uh, persons who can be able to uh, make presentations. And so it is important that we are able to have a clear understanding, yes, what area would we be able either to favor or what area would we be able to wish to be able to make uh, presentations on? 
And that is why when we are uh, saying that, can we make our fellowship topics to be very, very, you know, sharp, very succinct, just so that it's also very clear when we are, we, because we, the database we are building up is a national uh, mediators uh, speakers bureau. We know that if we have an, um, a call or we have a need for a speaker in an area that relates, related to environment, we know which uh, mediator we can be able to, um, to, to call on to. So we believe that that is um, uh, clear with regard to that on the two, on the two aspects when it comes to the uh, official pair and also when it comes to um, our own um, or the fellow's self uh, uh, requirements when it comes to advancing the, the, the uh, on the on their uh, speak mediators as speakers aspect and the fellowship directors um, assignments. So key things is that uh, we will be having uh, the, the 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 updated uh, fellowship directors binder uh, shared. Um, an important thing is for all the fellows who did not make their presentations at the matriculation weekend. For all the fellows who did not make uh, the, their presentations at the matriculation weekend, please ensure that you post in the chat. Please make sure that you post in the chat through this particular weekend that the topic that you're on with, because then we have now the segment that is for the colleagues who did not make their matriculation weekend presentations in as much as, yes, we still have to be aware we are still uh, having the, the fellowship director is still looking into how to be able to support them or I mean, what are the other um, options to be able to support them and ensure that they can be able to um, carry on in full with the, the, with the fellowship um, as, as with the other as with the other colleagues. And um, so with that, to just uh, summarize for all of us. So to summarize for all of us is that we have said, uh, to summarize for all of us is that we have said that uh, we will be sharing the, this uh, fellowship director's assignment um, uh, summary. And also we will uh, also share the updated, uh, the updated uh, uh, fellowship director's guide, uh, which has the listings of the, of the pairings. And any person who did not make a presentation at the matriculation weekend, uh, we make a request that this weekend, kindly uh, please share your, uh, the details of your, the, the details of your topic, because then that confirms uh, your uh, advancing on with your uh, fellowship topic, so that then we can know how to be able to, 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 to support. Uh, how can we, we can know how we can be able to um, have further support for you as we do advance on with the, with the uh, with the fellowship and so with that uh, colleagues uh, ladies and gentlemen we wish to be able to close uh, this particular co uh, conversation and uh, once again allow me to thank uh, every single person who has been part of this uh, particular journey and uh, we give you we give thanks also to God because we have had a great opportunity to be able to journey on together and we don't take this for granted. Kindly ensure that you have posted your name and your details in the in the uh, in the chat as a, a confirmation of your uh, or register for your attendance uh, for this uh, particular section. So, Mediator Sarah Ter, uh, I'm complete. Would you have something to say to us today as uh, you release us, Mediator Sarah Ter? Okay, I see Mediator, yeah, Mediator Sarah is, uh, is, uh, is, is muted. Uh, for, uh, for the fellowship uh, details and for the fellowship uh, progr progress with regards to the aspects of uh, being able to have the recording or being able to uh, listen in uh, uh, afterwards or, or um, being able to listen in afterwards, um, you are aware that you normally receive an alert in your fellowship account. Uh, to be able to listen to, to the sessions. Please take time to listen to them because they will be there for some time and you can be able to listen into them. So fellows, we say Asante Sana and uh, this has been a wonderful day and uh, we give thanks to God. So God bless you and have a good the rest of the day. We may now exit um, at pleasure. God bless you. Asante Sana. <laughs>